All right, chapter 35, the Cold War begins. As uh, the end of the war happened, uh, you know, you're going to, it's very reminiscent of the end of World War I, where uh, another Red Scare. And this is Red Scare too. So let's talk a little bit about this Cold War that lasted from the end of World War II, 1945, all the way up until 1991. It was an ideological struggle, right? a struggle of, of idealisms, of ideas that people had um, between the Soviet Union and the United States. So you see this, uh, this right here, it says the Soviet Eastern Bloc nations, which represented what's called the Iron Curtain. It was the Soviet Union, it was Russia, plus all their the countries that they had taken over um, the iron curtain they said was moving further and further westward as the soviets were taking over more territory versus the united states and their western democratic uh western democracies like france and england and as along with others too the goal of the soviet union would be to spread communism worldwide communism the goal of the u.s and the western democracies was the containment of communism, keep it where it is. Don't let it continue to spread. Um, so yeah, and then eventually the collapse of the communist world, according to George Kennan, which we'll be talking about soon. The methodologies used by both sides, how they they want they were going to undertake their plan or their goal. One through spying, espionage, the KGB for Russia, CIA for the United States, the arms race. Right, the, the buildup of nuclear weapons after the Manhattan Project. Um, that was all the rage, nuclear weapons. And then three, the ideological competition for the minds and hearts of third world people. Communist government versus democratic capitalist economy. This was big. The Soviet Union would come into a country and, and take, over, uh, take over their government and institute communism. And uh, they would they would tell the people that we're coming in here and we're going to eliminate poverty. Everybody's going to make the same amount. We're going to build factories. The government will own the factories. Russia will own the factories and all the workers will be paid. There will be zero unemployment, zero homelessness. All your medical care will be taken care of. Um, yeah, that that's a, the communist the, in a perfect Marxist society, which, by the way, has never been achieved there would be no upper class and no lower class. And that's what they would tell third world countries like, hey, we're coming in and we're gonna build your factories and everybody's gonna have a job. And that was enticing to some of these third world countries that were very poor. Um, the negative side was they became puppets of the Soviet government. The government, Soviet government was 100% in control versus the United States and the Western democracies that would throw a bunch of money at these countries as incentive not to go communist. And they would tell these countries, we're not going to demand control of your government. We're not going to take over your country like the Soviet Union would. We're going to, we're going to send you boatloads of money. But if you go communist, those boatloads will stop arriving. Um, so there, there's your ideological struggle between both sides. Um, and then lastly, the bipolarization of Europe, the forming of alliances between NATO and the Warsaw Pact that we'll get into. It was everywhere in movies, whether it be Rocky, Red Dawn, uh, books that people read where it was, you know, communism versus capitalism, Soviet Union versus the United States. Um, so, yeah. Harry S. Truman now was the president after the death of FDR, we know that. Uh, he had a saying that, that you still sometimes hear, hear today. He said, the buck stops here. The buck stops here, meaning I make the decision and it's, 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 I'm gonna own that decision. And whether it's right or whether it's wrong, I will either take credit or take blame. If it doesn't go exactly right, then he would take blame. It's his way of showing leadership and responsibility. And the other thing he used to say is, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And here's a, a sign that was on his desk that is in the Truman Library now. It's, it says, the buck stops here. The saying derives from the expression to pass the buck, which means to avoid responsibility. The sign came to express Truman's decisiveness and accountability. Okay, let's talk about this really important conference 
um, known as the Alta Conference. This was the last of the, the conferences between the big three amongst others uh, that Roosevelt was able to attend before his death. It was actually in February of 1945, uh, and he dies later in April of 1945. Uh, it says here, one of the many issues on the agenda for FDR and Winston Churchill and Stalin was to discuss what was going to happen after the war. They, they planned the United Nations at the Yalta Conference. The other idea was that Roosevelt's ultimate objective was to ensure that the Soviet Union would both participate in the United Nations and also help the United States finish off the war against Japan. They felt like this war could potentially drag on for a long time and they desperately needed the Soviet Union um, in the war with, with Japan in the Pacific. So he wanted to secure their, their um, help. And in order to do that, he threw a bunch of power at the Soviet Union when it came to the newly created United Nations. Um, here's some information here uh, in Killing the Rising Sun, a book that I read um, about, uh, about that, but Bill O'Reilly. Um, says here, the purpose of the Yalta Conference has been to define the shape of the post-war world. But even before the conference began on February 4th, Joseph Stalin tilted the odds in his favor, beginning with the location. Claiming that his health did not permit travel, Stalin insisted upon meeting in this, this Soviet city. The truth is, Stalin feels fine. He is simply afraid to fly. Meanwhile, a visibly declining Roosevelt travels 6,000 miles by ship and aircraft then endures an eight hour car ride to attend the conference. His villa room is bugged and the servants in his quarters are Soviet spies, meaning that FDR could never completely relax because he knows his every moment or movement is being scrutinized. That is as Stalin designed it. For the brutal dictator, well known, well knows that if he gets what he wants from Roosevelt and Churchill at this conference, he will rule almost half the globe. Stalin's goal is straightforward, return the Soviet Union to the same size and shape as the 19th century Russian Empire. His forces now occupy most of northern Baltic to the Pacific expanse, and the ambitious dictator has no intention of giving up any captured territory. Yet there is one significant part of the former empire that Russian troops do not yet occupy. Japanese held Manchuria in northern China. So when Roosevelt requests that Stalin enter the war against Japan, the president plays right into the dictator's hands. Stalin agrees to fight. Japan, but only after demanding that Roosevelt acquiesce on Manchuria. So yeah, at the Yalta conference, in the end, the Soviet Union promised that they would help against Japan, which they pretty much lied because, well, they, they ended up declaring war in between the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and uh, they ended up getting control of Manchuria, as well as some other areas in China. Uh, the Soviet leader pledged that Poland should have a representative government with free elections, as would Bulgaria and Romania, which he broke those promises because they did not have free elections. Uh, but they did uh, agree to attack Japan, um, which they never did attack Japan because they didn't need to because Japan surrendered. But they got a lot of territory. Critics of FDR, people who were acu accusing him of, people were accusing him of selling China down the river. Chiang Kai-shek was the leader of China, and they felt that Roosevelt just get handed over Chinese territory to the Soviet Union without even asking their permission. And there are the three R at Yalta. So there's a lot of Cold War issues between the United States and the Soviet Union, and, and here's what it boils down to. Good possible future essay here. It, at, at the very heart, it's communism versus capitalism. And then two, the U.S.'s refusal to recognize the Bolsheviks in Russia for the first 16 years, they finally did in 1933. That upset Russia. The United States and Great Britain delaying the opening of a second front in Europe during World War II. And the, the USSR then turned around and lost 20 million lives in the war. So they're very unhappy with that, obviously. Um, the U.S. and Great Britain froze the USSR out of nuclear secrets. They didn't find out about the nuclear bomb until... Potsdam, and Stalin was not happy about that. The U.S. then stopped Lend-Lease payments to the USSR in 1945 and refused USSR's request for a $6 million loan. The USSR's refusal to help aid post-war Europe 
and the USSR's aggressive expansion, like, you know, taking over territory aggressively. It's going to lead to four and a half decades of tension between the two countries. And the threat of nuclear annihilation was always in the back of people's minds. It was a heated rivalry uh, between the, the United States and the Soviet Union that never did amount to any bullets flying against each other, but indirectly it did. When you talk about Cold War wars like the Vietnam War and the Korean War. So let's talk about the shaping of post-war world after the war was over. There was a meeting in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, 1944. And they, the Western allies established what's called the International Monetary Fund to encourage world trade. So back to, hey, we got to stop by having high tariffs so we could promote international trade. The United Nations did open in April of 1945. The UN created the new Jewish state of Israel from Arab controlled Palestine. That's one of the first things that the United Nations did was to find a home for the Jews that were homeless at this point. And uh, they, were, they were looking for a place. So they carved out part of, of uh, Palestine in Israel, um, and, the, and it's still an issue today because the Palestinians that were there were forced, forced out and the Jews were allowed, the Jews from World War, displaced Jews from World War II were allowed to live in that area. <clears throat> the United Nations also had a broader perspective and goal before uh, the, the League of Nations, their goal was to prevent World War II. Well, that's super narrow. And when World War II happened, they were a failure. The United Nation also is gonna fight things like world hunger, disease. Um, so they're going to have many different purposes other than preventing World War III. Um, the little bit about the United Nations, the members drew up a charter similar to that of the old League of Nations. They formed what's called the Security Council. Uh, the big five in the Security Council consisted of China, the USSR, Britain, France, and the US. And they all had veto power. If one of them says no, then what? Then, then bills don't pass. The General Assembly is made up of a number of nations, other nations, that on a rotational basis. The permanent members, the big five, uh, are always there. Obviously, per meaning, that's what permanent means. And they, had, they definitely had veto power. So the General Assembly could come up with something, but any one of these countries could veto it, and it's dead. Has, has to be unanimous amongst them. There's a UN headquarters in New York talked about the creation of the Jewish state. The seeds of the Palestinian national consciousness sprouted in response to the British colonial presence and the expanding Jewish population. In November 1947, the United Nations voted in favor of partitioning Palestine into an Arab and a Jewish state, defining moment of Palestinians who rejected division of the contested Holy Lands. They didn't like that, obviously. Okay, and then the next thing was to put on trial the war criminals, uh, the Nazi war criminals from World War II. Uh, the Nuremberg trials were set up, punishing 22 of the top culprits of the Holocaust. A series of 13 trials carried out between 1945 and 1949. Hermann Goering, Rudolf Hess, uh, von Ribbentrop, all here um, were prosecuted. Heinrich Himmler was a leader of the dreaded SS of the Nazi party from 1929 until 1945. Himmler was the Third Reich's second most powerful man after Adolf Hitler. Given overall responsibility for the security of the Nazi empire, Himmler was the key uh, and senior Nazi official responsible for conceiving and overseeing the implementation of the final solution, the Nazi plan to murder the Jews in Europe. Himmler killed himself by biting down on a cyanide capsule and therefore was never tried. Once he was captured, a lot of uh, these men carried with them a cyanide tablet that in case they're captured, they pop the cyanide tablet and they kill themselves so they won't give up any information. <coughs> Pardon. Here's a picture of an execution of a German. German war mock general Anton Dossler is tied to a stake before his execution by firing squad in a stock stockade in Aversa, Italy on December 1st, 1945. The general commander of the 75th Army Corps was sentenced to death by United States Military Commission in Rome, Rome for having ordered the shooting of 15 unarmed American prisoners of war. And here's a, 
Another example, U.S. military authorities prepare to hang Dr. Klaus Karl Schilling, 74, in Landsberg, Germany, on May 28, 1946. In a Dachau war crimes trial, he was convicted of using 1,200 concentration camp prisoners for malaria experimentation. 30 died directly from inoculations. 300 to 400 died later from complications of the disease. His experiments, all with unwilling subjects, began in 1942. So horrific incidents um, with the Nazis, and, and many of them are paying the price. Okay, so let's talk about what they were going to do to, to uh, Germany after they lost World War II. America knew that an economically healthy Germany was indispensable to recover all of Europe. Um, they didn't want to make the same mistakes that they did post-World War I and uh, leave they, them decimated so that something else might happen down the road later on the re-rise of the Third Reich or something, Fourth Reich even. What they did is they broke up Germany into four zones controlled by the U.S., the USSR, Great Britain, and France. And they, they essentially broke them up into West Germany that was controlled by the U.S., Great Britain, and France, democratic, free market, capitalist economy. Uh, and then East Germany controlled by the USSR, and they were communists. And then Berlin, which is the capital located in Eastern Germany, was also broken up into four zones. So here you go. This is uh, the, the partitioning. So if you look at this right here, you have East Germany on this side and you have West Germany over here. Um, you could look at it this way. So East Germany is all red. And then West Germany, this area of West Germany controlled by the British, this area by the French, this area by the Americans. All of East Berlin was controlled by one country, the Soviet Union. And Ber uh, Berlin, which is the capital, totally surrounded by East Germany, was also broken up into four sections. as uh, It's a microcosm of the entire country, the capital was. And this is the area in 1961 where they built the Berlin Wall to separate East Berlin from West Berlin. So again, Berlin becomes a microcosm of the country. At one point, the uh, USSR in 1948 choked off all air and rail access to Berlin. Um, they didn't want the Americans, British, or French to be able to supply the people there. They, the, hopes by, the, the hopes for the Soviet Union was to get rid of the United States, Great Britain, and France and control Berlin, all, have control of Berlin all to themselves. Uh, the Allies then turned around and, you know, they could have, it could have, uh, led to World War III. I mean, there was tensions were high uh, and the allies uh, led by Truman decided to organize a massive airlift to feed the people of Berlin in May of 1949. They, they took food and supplies and dropped them out of airplanes to avert the blockade. It's the first ever confrontation between the US and the USSR and Stalin was the one who blinked. So if you see here, here's Berlin. So these flights started coming over and just dropping all this, all the supplies that were needed in West Berlin to the Americans, British, and uh, <clears throat> and the French. You could see here's here's Berlin. There's East Berlin, West Berlin, and this is where all the airplanes were flying over. And here's the planning of the airlift right here. Here's where the the flight path. Okay, so let's talk about the containment doctrine. Contain communism, keep it where it is. The Americans in the State Department had a, a guy by the name of George Kennan, who was known as a, I guess you could say a Sovietologist. He was a, a expert in Soviet affairs. And he said, and with his knowledge of the Soviet Union, he stated that firm containment of the Soviet expansion would halt communist power. He talked about a firm and vigilant containment of communism with a combination of military and political preparedness. If you have to use military, use military. If you have to use diplomatic means, use diplomatic means. You do whatever you need to do contain, to contain communism. And here's George Kennan here. It says here, George Kennan, a Sovietologist in the US State Department advocated developing a global foreign policy for the first time in American history outside of the immediate war. He believed the USSR to be inherently expansionist because the Russian empire 
under both the czars and the communists had sought to expand. His warning that the US ought to prepare itself to meet post-war Soviet expansion with a coherent plan response formed the basis for what became known as the Truman Doctrine. Truman Doctrine basically stated that, or Truman asked for $400 million to bolster Greece and Turkey to keep them from falling to communism. $400 million to uh, bolster Greece and Turkey, which are border, borderline bordering on the Soviet Union. Um, and they lo it looked like they were going to be next in the list of countries to be taken over by the Soviet Union. So it, it basically Truman stated this publicly, it must be the policy of the United States to support free people who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressure. So armed minorities within the country, because there were groups within Greece and Turkey that were trying to turn the country communist and outside pressure would be from the Soviet Union. So he's asking and he received $400 million to prevent that. So you see here's Turkey right here. Uh, here's Greece, dangerously close to the Soviet Union. Communism is starting to creep into those areas. Now the Americans were going to turn around and help out war-torn Europe with the Marshall Plan. Because the bottom line is this, if Americans didn't do it, then the Soviet Union would probably, they were afraid the Soviet Union would come in and then they would be taken over some of the Western democratic countries with, and, and instituting communism. Because places like England were a mess. France, were, they were a mess. They needed to help war-torn areas, Czechoslovakia. So the Marshall Plan provided for a formation of a European community. The plan was to help Europeans recover from the war. The plan sent $12.5 billion over four years to 16 cooperating nations to aid in recovery. And, and, and at first, government said, that's too much money. But then when the Soviets' tanks rumbled into Czechoslovakia to take it, uh, Congress said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll provide the $12.5 billion. So here you go. This is where the money went to. The higher the stack of dollars, dollar signs, the more money that was received. So places like England received a lot of money. France received a lot of money. Italy received a lot of money. Why? Because they're war-torn. And the Soviet Union, were, they were threatening to come in there and take these countries. You could be looking at, you know, we fought Germany in World War II. We could fought, fight the Soviet Union in World War III. So we had to fight fire with fire. We just sent boatloads of money. And we told those countries, if you start talking to the Soviet Union, we'll take away that money. And we'll consider you to be the enemy. You could see the countries that, you know, got the most from the Marshall Plan. It's, it's a political cartoon of Stalin trying to block the shot, block the Marshall Plan. In 1947, the National Security Act was passed. The restructuring of government, the creation of uh, the Department of Defense as opposed to the Department of War. So they decided after, we need to shuffle the deck a little bit here and make things better. So here, the National Security Act consisted of three different things. Created the, the Department of Defense, which is housed at the Pentagon, headed by the Civilian Secretary of Defense, and they also created the Civilian Secretaries of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. So restructuring of the Department of Defense, which was formerly the Department of War. Two, it also created the National Security Council. You'll oftentimes hear about the president's meeting with this National Security Council. To and and the, the purpose of this was to advise the president in security matters. The National Security Council consists of the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, the secretary of defense, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And then finally, the National Security Act created the CIA to coordinate government's fact-finding missions and kind of an espionage type thing. So the CIA created in 1947 after World War II. So the National Security Act in 1947 was huge. The creation of NATO, this is an alliance. Um, George Washington is probably not real happy turning over in his grave when the United States joined an army, the North Atlantic, joined, joined the Alliance, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, it started by the US, Britain, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands and Luxembourg, an attack on one men and an attack on all. 
And, uh, you know, it was an alliance against communism is what it was. NATO is still around today, but their identity has changed over time. There's the NATO members. Now, since the, you know, creation of NATO, then the, the communist countries got together and said, well, we're going to form an alliance too. And they formed the Warsaw Pact, which consisted of China when they go communist, the USSR, um, or members of, of Warsaw Pact. <clears throat> the restructuring of Japan. Japan needed a lot of money also to rebuild, especially after the atomic bomb. Japan was a mess. Uh, and also Tokyo, the firebombing, Doolittle's Raiders bombing of Tokyo, they were a mess. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur was put in charge and did a phenomenal job of rebuilding Japan. It was an incredibly quick and successful recovery in less than 20 years. A huge blow to the allied cause or the Americans and NATO's cause um, the world, a huge blow to the world cause was in 1949 when China, led by Mao Zedong, defeated the nationalist forces led by Chiang Kai-shek and turned China communist. With this defeat, a quarter of the world's population, 500 million people, were now plunged under the communist flag. So scared of a lot of, a lot of people in the United States, Cold War was getting more intense. Speaking of getting more intense, when it comes to nuclear weapons, that's what just made the Cold War even more intense than Red Scare One was nu nuclear weapons did. September of 1949, Truman announced that the Soviets had exploded their first atomic bomb three years before experts thought it was possible. Uh, that the United States no longer had a monopoly on nuclear power and people were afraid. It led to concern, hysteria, and fear of spies because no one believed that the Soviets would be able to do this on their own in that short of time. So everybody claimed that it had to be spies. So there's the first Soviet bomb. And then uh, the US exploded a hydrogen bomb in 1952, which is way more powerful than a nuclear bomb. One year later, the Soviets exploded their own hydrogen bomb. And now people knew for sure spies. There's no way they could have done that without spies. In 1955, the Soviet Union dropped the world's first airborne H-bomb, and Americans reacted with civil defense strategies such as duck and cover, and getting under your desk in school, and bomb shelters, and things like that. This is a test. Americans and yeah, a lot the Americans and the Soviet Union did thousands of tests. They they exploded nuclear weapons in underwater on islands to see what the overall effect was. This is a 1946 test at Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. You could see all the ships around here. The ships were strategically put there so that they could see, you could see what would happen with the effects of radiation. All the people who lived on the island were forced to leave. Some refused to leave and died from the fallout. You could see a, a, a different view of the Bikini Atoll bomb. You can see the ships right here. Ron Burgers, and he says, well, that escalated quickly. So Americans were, here's an example of duck and cover. These kids were told to get under their desk. Not that that would have really done anything if it were a nuclear bomb. Uh, people were uh, created fallout shelters at their homes. Between 1946 and 1962, the U.S. exploded 217 nuclear weapons over the Pacific and in Nevada. And there's an example of a homemade bomb shelter. They deliver the bricks and give you directions on how you build one. That's part one, chapter 35.